with New York State League of Women Voters President Dara Thompson and keynote speaker Senator Shelley Mayer. Today we will travel back 100 years to celebrate the passage of the 19th Amendment, take stock of where we are today in Albany, and how we can create a better future. Our annual luncheon is a collaborative effort. Thanks go to Larchmont Mamaronick League of Women Voters co-president Peggy Jackson and board members Judy Silverstein, Phyllis Caskell, Marlene Colbert, and as always, Ann Dooley from the Rye League, and Ina Aronow from the New Rochelle League. Thanks to Orienta Beach Club for this beautiful setting and our delicious lunch. And thanks to Maria Valenti of Chocolations and Mamaronick for the dessert chocolates. Thanks to LMC TV for filming today's event, and special thanks to all of you for supporting the League and taking action to make democracy work. We welcome co-president Peggy Jackson from the Larchmont Mamaronick League, Monica Gray, president of the New Rochelle League, Steve McCabe, president, co-president of the Rye Rybrook Porchester League, Mary Lou Green, president of the Westchester County League, and co-president Peter Rose and president-elect Eileen Nadelson of the Northeast Westchester League. We also welcome Evelyn Stock, past president of the New York State League and former presidents of the Shoreline Chapters, Emily Grant, Marlene Colbert, Nina Cuddy, and Debbie Reisner. Did I leave anyone out? Okay. All right. Welcome also our elected officials who are here with us today. Uh, please stand as I read your name, and to our guests, please hold your applause until I introduce everyone. Uh, I don't know if uh, George Latimer here is uh, here yet or Steve Otis, but we welcome Steve Otis and George Latimer, who will be with us, and uh, Westchester County Legislator Catherine Parker, Town of Ameronick Supervisor Nancy Seligson, and Council Members Jane Elkind Eney and Sabrina Fiddleman, Town Clerk Christina Battaglia, Village of Larchmont Mayor, Lorraine Walsh, and Trustee Malcolm Frauman, Village of Mamaroneck Mayor Tom Murphy, and Trustee Nora Lucas, Rye Town Supervisor Gary Zuckerman, Rye City Council Members Danielle Tagger Epstein and Sarah Goddard, and Rye Brook Village Trustee David Heiser. And who, Marlene? Sarah Bauer from from the village of Larchmont. Okay. Pardon me? I'm going to take care of it. Okay. We also welcome New York State League of Women Voters Executive Director Laura Bierman and Colleen Geary, the League's annual fund manager. We're pleased to have with us today filmmaker Robert Millman, who has produced with his daughter Rachel Millman a documentary titled Line in the Street that captures the successful gerrymandering lawsuit brought by the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania. New York passed a constitutional amendment which becomes effective in 2020 to establish new redistricting procedures. Bob will say a few words later in our program about his film and its implications for New York. In the spirit of women who have taken a leadership role to uphold our democracy, Today we recognize Ruth Heinerfeld, who became president of the League of Women Voters of the United States in 1978. Ruth helped, <laughs> Hi, Ruth. Ruth held office in the aftermath of Watergate and when the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment was front and center. Please accept our thanks and appreciation, Ruth, for your service. One hundred years ago, after a 75-year struggle by suffragettes inspired by New Yorkers such as Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the United States Congress voted on June 4, 1919, to pass the 19th Amendment, which it ratified on August 18, 1920. The 19th Amendment states, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Now when we lament how far women have to go to fully establish equal rights, we have a valid point. But women have made progress too, especially given our historic roles. Married women were previously considered chattel, personal property of their husbands, unable to sign contracts or own property. 
Over lunch, take a look on your table at the petition that, uh, to New York State Legislature dating back from 1854, seeking women's equality and the legislator's response. These documents speak volumes regarding women's role before the Civil War. For context of the times 100 years ago, before you leave today, take a look at the century-old government-issued posters I have displayed addressing food, emerging attention to public health, World War I, and the government's aspirations as to how citizens should conduct their lives for the good of one another and America's allies. Today, let's stop and smell the roses and celebrate the rights that we do have, including the right to vote. Thanks to the unrelenting work our great-grandmothers, grandmothers, and mothers undertook on our behalf, and how their formidable and at times life-threatening efforts can inspire how we will carry on for the benefit of today's children and future generations. The creation of the League of Women Voters has a central role in our history. Here to talk about the League in New York State's of women voters is President Dare Thompson. After teaching English and social studies for several years, Dare spent a quarter century as an executive director of several small mid-sized arts organizations, including an arts center in central New York, the statewide arts advocacy organization in Ohio, and the Hudson Valley Writers Center in Sleepy Hollow. Join, Dare joined the Pennsylvania League of Women Voters in her 20s, where she was the president of the Swarthmore League. And as she moved, Dare has served as president of the Rhode Island League, vice president of the Ohio League, and now as president of the New York State League. Dare serves on the New York Suffrage Commission and will take us on a journey of the League's history. Please give a warm welcome to Dare Thompson. Beth is so much taller than I am. Can you see me? <laughs> anyway, well, I'm, I'm glad for that setup because, the, of course, the League grew right out of the women's suffrage movement. And um, I, first, I would just want to say I'm delighted to, to be back here. Last year, and shortly after this event last year, Beth sent me the video, and I actually watched it. And I heard George Latimer speak, and all, all kinds of good things happened. So it's fun to be here this year. Now I get to see it unfold in person. But anyway, the... Um, the, those women who start, how many have been to Seneca Falls? Oh good, I was afraid it would be even fewer than that. It's pretty far to go, but um, worth the trip. And, and I have heard some New Yorkers, city, city New Yorkers, um, be sort of surprised at how sleepy it is. You know, they thought, wow, we're going to Seneca Falls and this is gonna be really exciting. Um, at the, in the time of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and uh, Lucretia Mott and Susan B. Anthony and all, it, it was a very lively place, and it was because the Erie, and I just learned, the suffrage stuff is so interesting. The Erie Canal had a huge effect on this state in a way that I don't think I fully realized until I put these two things together. It really cracked open the state, and think about what that would do. All these crazy ideas from us down here could go up the Hudson River and across um, the, the middle part of New York State and um, really change people's thinking. So you had Frederick Douglass up there, Susan B. Anthony, and all kinds of really great thinkers. And um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's home was kind of a hotbed of, of, of um, progressive thinking. So anyway, we, the, our, our history kind of begins there. Um, those women, the two in particular who became, Lucretia was always involved, but she's really from Philadelphia. And, um, and she's a Quaker, and I was very proud to learn how important the Quakers were because I am one, and I didn't even know that. Um, I mean, I knew they were there, but I had no idea. If you go to Seneca Falls, you'll see what I, I mean. I was shocked. Anyway, the, um, uh, where was I when I distracted myself with my own history? Um, <laughs> anyway, the, um, the, the two women, uh, everybody thinks Susan B. Anthony was there when the, human, the Women's Rights Convention took place, but she was not. Uh, she lived over in Rochester, and, and it wasn't long before um, Amelia Bloomer, famous for the Bloomers, um, brought them together and the, the rest is history as far as the two of them go. They, you know, march on together for many, many years and um, they die without seeing the vote won. And that's kind of sad except that they created an organization that um, 
out of which rose Carrie Chapman Catt. And how many people know who she is? See, this is shocking, and we have to fix this. So your job in 2020 <laughs> is to bring this up at every single suffrage event you go to, because she is the brainchild of, of really getting the vote there. In, um, first, in 1917, she was the um, thinker behind the strategy that got, won us the vote here in New York, and we had the vote before the national people, you know, everybody got it. And she said, if we can win New York, we can break the whole back of the resistance movement and we can win the vote nationally. And she thought it would take four years and it only took two. So New York, you, uh, you, when you look at the suffrage history, you get prouder and prouder. As I grew up in Ohio for quite a while, but then I ended up ultimately here in New York for most of my life. And um, it makes me very proud of, um, of all the people I've named so far. Um, they, you know, everybody came to New York. It was so important and it remained so. So in, um, now getting finally to the league history, the, uh, Carrie Chapman Catt said, when we win the vote, we will become the League of Women Voters. And th what you know today of the league is very familiar, um, uh, to, she would be familiar to Carrie because she ha had this idea of all these little suffrage organizations all over the state and around the country um, where people could work locally and, and really grassroots. And so those suffrage organizations all became local leagues. So we were born as a state league, because this is part of the process too, there were state organizations. Um, we happened to have our birthday on November 19th, 1919. The city league started in the spring of that year. The national league wasn't founded until um, Valentine's Day in uh, 1920. So everybody kind of, whenever they had their next big event where they could make it official, they did so and bit by bit, the League of Women Voters was born kind of like flowers coming out of the, out, of, out in the spring, um, it, you know, across the country. And it remains the great strength of the league that we have these local organizations and we fight like crazy to help keep you strong and it's why you have Laura and Colleen and me and other people who care very much about the, the whole state um, here today with you when, when um, Beth called, we came. So, and, and of course we have these wonderful other people who have been supporting us, the state league so strongly and who've gone on and done national things as well um, here, t here today. Um, I want to show you what, what we're doing to honor this history. We, we said, well, of course we have to write this down. There was a book done in a 75th year, but it was, um, it, you know, it was a little dry and it was kind of a timeline sort of thing. And we thought, well, this one has to be really readable and, and tell the whole story, and it's much more thematic, uh, less this is when this happened, boom, boom, boom. Um, and the cover is available for viewing um, <laughs> off the print, you know, off the, off the copier, but it's at the printers now, the whole book, and um, we will be seeing it um, officially in, at the convention in June, but it will be, some copies will be available sooner. And over on that table, there are um, pieces of paper you can pick up to order a book. Um, if, if you'd like to do that in advance, but they will, they will be available. And the other thing we did, and Beth, I'm sure you're in there. I should have checked. I was looking through it just this morning. Um, the local league histories, I don't, did you send the history? Some, y people will still be able to, to um, create their own histories. We're hoping that this book will encourage any league that didn't do it, um, you know, we have maybe two thirds of them, um, that uh, send in histories of their own. And we, we thought originally we would incorporate them in this big, big book about the state, and we realized, oh my gosh, this is way too much, we can't. So we printed everything just the way we got it. So some of them are short, some of them go on and on, some of them, you know, are timelines, some, you know, the real variety, and it's gonna be a lot of fun for you to see that. So that will be coming up. So I think, and just, I wanna um, talk about the league today a little bit and just say the history continues. Um, the, the big thing, which, really is still, we still have whiplash from this election law reform. I mean, my gosh, how long have we been fighting for that? Some of you in the room, you know, could, would say decades, decades and decades. And, and then push, suddenly the new legislature comes in in January and we have election law reform. And there's a sheet over there that um, enough for everybody to take one home that lists all, it's kind of like a cheat sheet of everything that just happened in January that made our lives as voters, so much better. <laughs> it's incredible, yes. <laughs> 
and now our job is, a big job this coming year will be to educate voters, let them know of all these changes, because while we were paying very close attention, you know, the general public has a lot of things on their minds, and, and uh, they, they need help knowing about this. And, and we fight for many other things, and Laura is here, and Laura, I don't know if you got noticed, is where, wherever you are, stand up so people know. If you've got questions about anything with the state, she's our executive director, and she can talk also about what's happening at the legislature, and of course, if you can get Shelley afterwards, you can certainly ask her, um, but there, um, you know, there's much to follow there that's, that we still wanna have done. There's plenty more to fight for. Um, and we think that because of this tide change where we may get court reform, which is another thing that goes back decades um, with the league, and, and it's an area that we have an expertise in that is really gonna kick in um, if that moves forward the way we're hearing that it probably will. The other thing, a couple of other things, Beth, how am I doing on time? A couple more points. Okay, we, the other thing's just about to happen. I mentioned the convention, so we're planning for that. But we are about to have 60 high school kids, um, and you all send, always send one at least, um, to uh, Albany for Students Inside Albany uh, day. It's three days. Um, and the, the kids stay there. They, they um, follow their legislators, their own personal legislators, or um, I if possible. And they sit on the Senate floor and the Assembly floor, and they um, really get to know state government. And when they're done, they know more about state government than almost every any New Yorker you'll find anywhere. I think if you ever ask anyone about their state government, you will know what I mean, <laughs> because it's a it's a it seems far away and distant to them. But these kids really get in there. They talk to the media people. They talk to lobbyists, and they um, it, it's a it's an eye opening experience. And we are so proud of that program. Um, and. Uh, we uh, will continue to fight for all kinds of legislation that you, you all are telling us you care about. The environment is always huge. Um, education, so it's so great Shelley's here, is another big topic. So um, we depend on you. The local leagues are our lifeblood, and uh, we, we are so happy to be here. And waving the state flag, don't forget us, and um, we're here for you, and, and I know you're always here for us, so thank you. Oh, on the book, I forgot to mention Evelyn and, and uh, Emily are big supporters of that book, too. And um, uh, Emily was the first person to put down serious money on that book, so we have them to thank for that, too. They, we can keep thanking them. <laughs> We're going to bring out lunch, and I'm going to keep talking. You'll have a chance to visit, but, but we have a full program, and uh, we love to talk, so we hope you don't mind listening. Um, so thank you so much, Dare. <clears throat> We have for each of you to uh, take home today and memorize for next year's trivia uh, contest, the newspaper gazette, How Women Got the Vote. Did everyone get one when you came in today? If you didn't get one, please pick one up on the, on the way out. It actually is an overview nationally of how women got the right to vote. And again, New York was the spark. Uh, we've got a lot to be proud of. Consider the Americana postcard and the League of Women Voters badge that celebrates 100 years of fighting for democracy as advanced recognition for what you will do to further democracy for the next 100 years. That's our gift to you. This year, I'm swapping multiple political trivia questions for a single question about gravity. It's an old metaphoric saw. If a tree falls in the forest and no one hears, does it make a sound? Effective communication represents a cornerstone of democracy. These days, guaranteeing the flow and actual receipt of useful information from and about the government to the community presents an ongoing challenge. So is getting the facts. We're going to change that. With your help, LMC TV is a new survey we all need to complete so LMC TV can continue its mission to optimally serve our community we are pleased to have here today LMC TV Executive Director Matt Sullivan and Assistant Director Dina Schumacher with us. Let's welcome them, please. In addition, high school students taking Joe Liberti's original civic research and action program have a short survey specifically targeting the flow of information between government and citizens with the added twist of seeing if you would use an app to access that information. We are pleased to have Joe Liberti here with us today as well. Welcome, Joe. 
I have here um, a, um, a uh, you're going to have to, um, I don't know what these are exactly because I don't use these things, but if you have a magic smartphone or something, I think you can probably figure out how to use these to get the survey. Otherwise, what we're going to do is uh, we'll send it to everybody on our email list. And if you uh, don't have the surveys and if you're not on our email list, you can uh, let us know. And for our neighboring chapters, please consider adapting these surveys for your community. I think we'll all agree that with the social media today, even though we have all these different ways to communicate, sometimes it's very difficult for us to get the message out to people. And that's something that we're struggling with. And I think we all want to find the solution. Now, one more uh, important thing. Uh, I attended a day-long conference for educators at the United Nations last Friday, sponsored by CETON, the Committee on Teaching about the United Nations. And the subject was climate change. Two speakers stood out. The first, Selena Nirok Leem, is a courageous 21-year-old advocate for ocean and climate awareness from the Marshall Islands. She was the youngest delegate at COP21 in Paris, and Selena recited a riveting tribute to her deceased parents and grandparents, expressing grief over the angry, ever-rising waves that increasingly threaten their final resting place and her island home, as does the leaking waste from America's historic nuclear testing there. The second speaker, Franz Baumann, who currently teaches at NYU, focusing on the international governance of climate change, is a re retired from the United Nations after a 30-year career with a rank of Assistant Attorney General, most recently a Special Advisor on the Environment and Peace Operations. Professor Ra Franz candidly observed that adults are not taking meaningful enough action to address the climate crisis, imploring the professors and teachers in attendance to inspire those we teach that essential action must be taken. Now, as I look out today at the guests here, I see New York's most committed environmental advocates. I work alongside adults who are kicking it, and we are kicking it. But here's the message. The mounting science makes clear that all of us here have to kick it up a notch, as if our lives depend upon it, because our kids need us to, for their well-being. The actions we take inspire others to act, those actions and the ripple effects that inspire others truly matter for our next generations. You can start with a few things, consume less beef, go to Meatless Mondays, stop using plastics, eat leftovers. These things really do matter. And participate in your municipality's food waste to compost recycling program, which creates enriched soil and further uh, progress toward achieving our near zero waste goals. The elected representatives here in this room are on board with food waste recycling, but we need expansive citizen participation that reaches a critical mass to economically justify a shift in services such as expanded curbside pickup. Get started next week, if you haven't yet, by picking up a food waste kit from your town village hall. And talk to me later if your community hasn't yet begun. There are committed people here in Westchester to help you get the ball rolling. There are two Be Earthwise guides on the State League's homepage that provide useful information to help you reduce your carbon footprint. So let's follow in the can-do footsteps of our hardy foremothers by shifting our habits for the benefit of our collected children. We can do this. Let's do this. I'm going to uh, take a break, let you have a chance to visit a little bit, and I'll be back uh, in about, probably about 10 minutes to introduce our guest speaker, New York Senator Shelley Mayer. Eat quick, but we're going to have a good rest of the program. Thank you. Up, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our state senator before Shelley Mayer speaks to you. Senator Shelley Mayer has spent her career as an advocate for New Yorkers, serving six years in the State Assembly before being elected to fill the Senate seat vacated by County Executive George Latimer. Shelley Mayer has been a champion for children and public schools throughout her time in the state legislature, chairing committees on education and championing students with special needs. Senator Mayer has also championed in her work reproductive health, civil rights, and protections for consumers and tenants. 
Prior to being elected as a member of the state legislature, Shelley Mayer served as chief counsel to the New York State Senate Democrats, and prior to that, Senator Mayer served as a senior counsel at the National State Attorney General program at Columbia Law School, focusing on health care and labor-related issues. Senator Mayer also served as Vice President of Government and Community Affairs at Continuum Health Partners, which is one of New York City's largest teaching hospital systems, and as an Assistant Attorney General under New York Attorney General Robert Abrams, ultimately becoming a senior advisor to Attorney General. Please join me in a warm welcome for Senator Shelley Mayer. Thank you. Yeah, that's not too big a step, is it? Uh, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here, and thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. Thank you to everyone here. Special thank you to my real mentor in this process. Uh, two of them actually are here. One is Senator Susie Oppenheimer. Fantastic. I was very, very fortunate to work with her. And of course, uh, among my other elected officials, but County Executive George Latimer, where is George now? Back in the corner. My partner and friend, along with all of my other elected officials, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to, to be here. And I'm so proud to be a League member. I've been a member of the League. I, I have a few gripes with the way the League is organized in Westchester because I lost my East Yonkers Sarah Lawrence College League and it merged with the Hudson side of the Westchester League where I don't represent anymore. So I'm. And now I have to join every other league in the new district, but it's, it's, all, it's all a fantastic opportunity. I want to say a little bit just before I jump into what's happening and what has happened and the remarkable change that has happened in Albany this year, uh, uh, two short stories. One is we were talking about the suffragettes, and there's, I found in the Barnard uh, College alumni newsletter a little story about my grandmother who went there, Lily Stein, who, uh, in her white, marched down Fifth Avenue um, in the early teens. And it, it's something I'm very proud about. I have a, one side of my family that's very uh, first-generation immigrant. My grandmother came when she was seven years old from Russia. Uh, and the other side, which has been here for a while. And on the suffragette side was a, sort of this progressive side that had been part of the American tradition and I was very proud to have my grandmother be part of that, as a young, very young woman, part of that movement. The other story I was saying to some people early on, one of the ways I got interested in knowing that the world was bigger than what I saw at home was that my parents started when we were quite young, taking us once a year, all four children, on a tour to a place we had not been and that was outside our experience. The first year we went to Appalachia, we drove, from our house in Yonkers. We went to a mine. We uh, went through the hills, the Blue Hills, I remember that. The next year we went to Pittsburgh and we went to a factory, the Heinz factory, the first time I had actually seen a production line. And this was part of my exposure to a world that was bigger than my little life at home. And I think that's one of the most important things is that we're dealing with a big complex world and in state government, we're dealing with a changing world. And uh, credit to the League, really, which has moved along with the times. When I started in Albany in the 1980s representing Bob Abrams, I dealt very much with the League because we didn't have too many allies at that time on the issues we cared about. Susie and Barbara Bartoletti, and I had a few other friends who were on my side. Now, the League has won probably the most major victory on election reform, credit to the League's leadership and vision on really getting the world to recognize we can do better. So I want to credit the League for moving ahead with the times and having a much bigger view than the old-fashioned perspective of the League, and, and it really is a credit to you. So <laughs> let me jump in and tell you about the exciting times in Albany since uh, January of this year. It really has been a, I have to say, having been there for many years in many different capacities, the energy of the moment is extraordinary. Not that energy and passion and new people don't come with conflict and 
I'm happy to answer questions about today's New York Times story, if anyone read it. But uh, that being said, there is a feeling in the air that things have changed for the better. And you see it with these fantastic new members. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. They bring passion, energy, and enthusiasm, and they have helped drive a better agenda. So it's a remarkable moment. So here I am, one of the Senate Democratic majority. Uh, you know, we're up to 39. If Simca Felder votes with us, right, George? Then we're at 40. Um, sometimes he does. We have a very diverse conference. We have 15 new members, 15 people who have never been in the Senate before. Um, we have a record number of women. We have much more diversity than we ever had, racial, ethnic, religious, which is a fantastic new addition. We have a member-driven conference. So we sit around in a room every day, and we decide what issues we are going to bring to the floor, what issues we are going to fight about, how we got to these things that we did in the first 90 days, came from the members, not from staff, and not from Andrea, who is a fantastic consensus builder leader and a listener. But this was driven by the members. So I, I want to make sure that you understand that. So what did we do in the very beginning? Uh, well, I think, talking to a league audience, election and voting reform is the most remarkable achievement to me. Uh, early voting, which is a huge breakthrough, then New York was really behind. Any of us who have worked on elections on any side of the aisle know that there are a significant number of people now who simply aren't getting to the polls because they can't get there between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. Or by the time you get them at 7 o'clock when they got home, they've lost the impetus to go. And why not make it easier? Why not expand our democracy? And I'm so happy that that's sort of the league's uh, model slogan. Same day voter registration. That, that we have to amend the Constitution. It's going to take some time to do. But I know I've been in polling places where people come in and say, can I register today? I am interested. I heard about this election. I met somebody I want to vote for. We're going to change that if we if, uh, eventually get it through. No excuse absentee voting. Huge change. I mean, we have had a court decisions that have modified the provision in the Constitution that requires that you actually have an excuse. But you shouldn't need any excuse to submit an absentee ballot, and we're going to change that. Closing the LLC loophole. That was one of the most outrageous things that basically you could uh, circumvent the election limitations on contributions by creating five Shelley Mayor LLCs. Each one gave the maximum. Shelley Mayor LLC one, Shelley Mayor LLC two, and each one could give the maximum, but it was all really Shelley Mayor, and it was all fine, and it wasn't fine. It was a way to really go around the law, and we changed that. Consolidating the federal and state primaries. This was something we tried to do every year when we were in the minority. I was in the assembly. We always voted for it. We could not get the prior majority to agree to consolidate the primaries. Now, I know we made a very quick change. And for people who are in the political process, we sort of upset the apple cart. Sometimes you have to upset the apple cart to make big change. And that's what we did. We saved money. And we make it more likely people are going to vote because the primaries for state and for Congress are going to be on the same day. We could not get that done. And that should not have been hard to get done, but it was. And uh, voter registration transfer. Now, I have to say I'm, I'm always a little parochial since I've lived and done politics in probably the most difficult community in Westchester and Yonkers. People move, and they do not change with the Board of Elections. They got a long list of things, the cable, the insurance, the rent, the lease. They do not take it upon themselves to go to White Plains and change the form. But they only moved a few blocks within their community. We are now changing it so that if you're within the same, uh, basically, I think, assembly district, you can move and come to that, that table and not be turned away. So that is a huge change. These are all sort of, honestly, you think they're low-hanging fruit, but nothing is, seems to be low-hanging fruit. And that is one of the points of my talk today. Nothing is easy, but if we sort of get enough public sentiment 
and we change the face of who represents us, we can get so much of it done. And then in the budget, and I'm going to sort of flip between what we did prior to the budget and then the budget, we did put in money, oh, I lost my glasses in this, um, for some early voting costs so that they're not all borne by the local boards of elections. And um, we added online voter registration to be something that boards are going to be able to do. And e-poll books. So uh, these are all sort of the instruments of moving forward with election reform. We did most of it pre-budget. We did it in concert with the assembly, completely negotiated with my colleagues. You know, Steve is here. I, I always say I'm so fortunate to have Steve as one of my partners in the assembly. When we worked together, we just sort of rolled along. Now, I will talk about our role with the governor in a separate conversation. We try to do very well with him. We have our differences, in case you haven't noticed. But on many things, we were all on the same side. And these election reforms were part of it. Then the next thing we did that was very important and near and dear to my heart was gun safety. You know, I ran in that very, very heated election. And in the middle of it was parkland, what happened in Florida. And I never thought guns would be the defining issue in my election, but it was extremely important to many people, particularly mothers, who never participated in local elections. They decided they wanted uh, this issue to be front and center, and they made it front and center. So I was very, very pleased that we took action right away. The uh, ERPO, it's called, the, the red light bill, um, which allows police, teachers, and family members to petition a court when a person who has a gun lawfully is a risk to themselves or others, we got that passed. That is a path breaking. You know you live next to somebody in an apartment or a house, that person has a gun, maybe several guns. Then the person starts acting strange or peculiar or dangerous or rage infused or anything else which makes you think, I really am very nervous about this person having a gun. Now, and many times the family member can go and petition a court to have a court determine that the person is a risk to themselves or others and have law enforcement remove the gun. That would have made a change in, in Parkland where people knew this person was a danger and there was nothing the police could do. So that was tremendous grassroots movement of bombs demand action and gun advocate, and, you know, gun safety advocates and I think a common sense view that we could do better and do what other states did. We also banned the bump stocks, which they used in Las Vegas, that turned a gun into a rapid fire gun. Uh, that was such, it was done administratively, but we needed to put it into law and we did that. We extended the national instant background check to 30 days. It had been that had been three days, your background check uh, didn't come back clear, you could get the gun. So you apply for the gun, and you have no background problem, you have no criminal history, fine. You know, it comes back right away. What if, you know, in Santa Fe, 10 years ago, you have a conviction for a domestic violence uh, offense and it's not in the registry? You should not be granted that license simply because nothing came up quick enough. You may need enough time to do a more thorough review. So we, we significantly expanded the time to ensure that there is more information before a gun sale uh, occurs. And I feel very, very strongly about that. One bill that I sponsored, it came out of my own experience of a terrible case in Yonkers, uh, was an, a gun buyback program. They, these are programs that incentivize, particularly churches and community groups, to tell people we're gonna give you a $500, come in with those guns you have. And people will come in with some number of them, but we have a hodgepodge system. We could have a model program. Some are better than others. They're best practices. And I was very pleased that was part of the, uh, the gun safety agenda. Next of the what I call the big things, banning conversion therapy. We finally banned at the state level this really a completely illegitimate form of therapy to try to change young children uh, who, who self-identify as gay or lesbian. Uh, this, was, this has been around. It's been very, very damaging to young people. It's professionally viewed as illegitimate. 
but it was not banned, and we banned that. That, again, you think these were easy? Nothing is easy. Um, and gender, another bill we tried for a long time to prohibit discrimination based on gender identity or expression and adding transgender New Yorkers. You know, I say about um, this expansion of our worldview that there are so many people on what my mother used to call like the spectrum of sexuality. We used to have this very little limited view, man, woman, nobody could be in between, nobody could vary. We have learned in time that the world is more complicated and that we have to adopt our laws to reflect that we want civil rights protections for a broader group of people who self-define differently. And I, that was long, long overdue. Another one we passed in the assembly every year. We could never get it on the floor of the Senate until we had this new majority. And we just went right ahead. And I would say on some of these we had bipartisan support, but a fair number we did not. One of which that we did have bipartisan support, the Child Victims Act, another one that you know, sat on the sidelines all of last year, notwithstanding that there was a promise they would do it, to change both the criminal and civil statute of limitations uh, for adults who, who rediscover later in their lives that they were the victims of child sexual uh, abuse. Particularly, this was a very sensitive subject in with the Catholic Conference, with the uh, very observant Jewish community, we were able to do really what needed to be done, changing both the civil and criminal statute of limitations and creating a one-year window after we passed the bill so that people could sue. Ironically, all of the other side, this bill passed unanimously after the, the other side would not bring it to the floor. Once we brought it to the floor and everyone argued about how troubling it was, they all voted for it. So that was a, a very good step forward. On health and reproductive rights, I mean, many of you may know, we did pass the Reproductive Health Act. It was a contentious, and for some of us, a difficult subject, um, because I don't think, personally, that was explained entirely well enough, and we were up against a counteroffensive uh, that mischaracterized what the bill did. But the bottom line is we codified Roe v. Wade's language about both early abortion and the rare late-term abortion into New York's public health law and took it out of the penal law, the criminal law, where it had been for since the 70s. And we promised we would do it. It was the right thing to do. I have a number of constituents who were very troubled by what they heard about it, and I've made it my business to sit down with them and explain to them that what is said about the bill is inaccurate, that uh, the bill really used the word life or health of a mother just like Roe v. Wade did, but that we put it into New York law. So whatever happens at the Supreme Court, and God knows we don't really know anymore, this very basic, what was deemed to be a constitutional right of women is at risk, and we wanted it to be under New York law codified. So I'm very pleased we did that, but again, it, it came at some cost to some of my colleagues in some districts. They really faced a very difficult time. We did a number of other things uh, on health, the Comprehensive Contraception Coverage Act, uh, the BOSS bill. I don't want to run out of time, but I want to talk about some of the things we're doing now. And raising the age of tobacco, we just did that to 21, which, uh, again, very good public health move. And um, I hope we're going to do some, actually, uh, proactive things on measles and on vaccinations, another highly contentious issue. I think the time for leadership is now. Um, it's unfortunate that the anti-vaccine world has created a momentum for their issue, but I think that we are at a, a turning point in, 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 this moment, in this moment where we cannot let this go unanswered. And I think we are going, when we get back in two weeks, I think we are gonna take strong action again on the immunization front. Not sure exactly what it'll look like. Um, I was very honored to be named the chair of the Senate Education Committee. It is probably the biggest share of state money. And um, thank you. And that's because uh, I am a true advocate for public schools. And public schools and public school funding needs serious reexamination. 
whether you are in Port Chester, East Chester, Yonkers, Mamaroneck, Rye, uh, every one of our communities, the way the state funds public education is frankly out of date, inadequate. It came out of a good faith effort to address need, but it's outdated and frankly it's ignored. It's ignored in the breach, shall we say, and uh, politics drove funding more than student need. So what are some of the things we're doing? Well, first we had to get through this budget and uh, argue for more money and compromise with the governor. Some of you may have seen I was very critical of what the governor did on foundation aid. I thought he was wrong about the law. I think he was wrong about the amount of money he put on the table. We fought to get as much as we could. The budget is a compromise effort. Uh, at the end of the day, we got as much as we could, a doubling of what he put on the table for foundation aid, and then we did our best to distribute it more fairly based on need. The indicia of e need in the old formula are no longer the way we should judge things. Good example, free and reduced lunch. That used to be the way you judged how poor students in a public school were. Well, we have several problems. One is some schools offer lunch to everyone, so you don't have to fill out the form. Secondly, the world of immigration has changed our communities. Our communities are far more diverse. Every school district in Westchester has significantly more Spanish speakers than it ever had, and it has parents who are reluctant to fill out any form that they think is gonna trigger a review of their status. So for many reasons, free and reduced lunch is no longer the right way to judge poverty, in my opinion. But it is what we started with, and right now we had to deal with it. So we dealt with the budget. We did get more money for, for public schools. And we fought back against many of the governor's proposals that would be bad for public schools. And we tried not to let the charter schools in New York City be the driver of a disproportionate amount of money as they have been in the last 10 years of the other majority. And they were taking the, you know, we don't have enough to fund extra money for charter schools in New York without any accountability. And it is something we're gonna deal with going forward. We did some other things in the budget that I'm proud of. You know, I got more emails about libraries than I got about public schools, because the, and this is a tribute to the library community and those that believe that libraries are really the new sort of town square. In my opinion, they have taken up the mantle of being our public place. Uh, so we fought hard for the libraries. Again, in the context of our new Democratic majority, which I know is part of what I am charged with, there was overwhelming support, number one for public schools. That was the number one issue in our conference. Robert Jackson, who was an original plaintiff in the CFE lawsuit that created this concept of sound basic education, is now a member of the Senate Democratic majority. He beat an incumbent Democrat who was part of the IDC, that group that had allied with the Republicans, and he made it his business to talk about this, as I did, at every turn. So I am very fortunate to have such dynamic uh, sort of soul brothers and sisters who believe that public education is the path for a diverse New York, but we have to invest in it. We can't walk away from it. So I, I very much appreciated their support. We also added, for things that I care about, the Empire State After School Program. I've been a big proponent of after school for a long time. Anybody who knows a parent that gets out at 3 p.m. from work, unless they're a teacher, please raise your hand. The rest of us all work later, and frankly, our schools, in my opinions, should start to be the kind of community resource that libraries are. I believe they should be open weekends. I believe they should be available in the evenings. I believe the schools belong to the entire community. After all, you're paying the taxes for them. And after your kid graduates from 12th grade, you're still paying the taxes. Schools should be community resources. And I've told that to the teachers world. They don't always like hearing it. I've told it to the um, school boards. They don't always like it. And the superintendents, they don't always like it. But the fact is, to gain support for public school and public education, we have to regain this sense that our public schools belong to everyone. It's something I've fought, I have fought hard for. There's a few other things I want to talk about, um, and, then, and then you'll give me my, keep going? 
Okay. Okay. Two things that are very important. We just did criminal justice reform in the budget. That was an extraordinary opportunity to change the way New York handles things. I was very fortunate to be named by Senator Stuart Cousins to be on a little group of six very diverse opinions in trying to shape a bill that we could pass. You know, we have six new members from Long Island, some from conservative districts in Suffolk, Hudson Valley, some far more conservative. We have, um, obviously, Brooklyn, the Bronx, a lot of highly urban communities that felt the pain of the way some of our criminal justice uh, laws have worked. So it was hard to find something that everyone could vote for. And I was proud to be part of it. So we really did something remarkable. We eliminated cash bail and pretrial detention for misdemeanors on nonviolent felonies. We, we were committed not to have another uh, situation where a young man is kept in Rikers for three years for allegedly stealing a backpack, put in solitary confinement, all because he couldn't afford bail. Had nothing to do with being com convicted of any crime and ultimately committed suicide as a young man. That was a turning point in, in New York. And I, I, I think it's quite remarkable we did that. We also changed the speedy trial uh, requirements to really push prosecutors to actually be ready when they say they're ready and to move up the date if they're not. Obviously, you need more time, but we tried to do that and discovery reform, requiring more uh, current production of documents to the defendant with protections for victims. That's one of the reasons I was there, to talk about trying to protect particularly domestic violence victims from having too much of their information turned over to the defendant. So that was a really a big, a big, big deal that we did in the budget. Why it was in the budget, that's a subject for another day. Um, <laughs> lastly, I just want to say something. I, uh, as, as chairman of education and uh, as someone who talks to lots of students, came up with uh, the, really the belief that we are not doing well enough in teaching civics and encouraging civics in our school. <laughs> I think this is the lead voice in me talking, but uh, I've been working on this for, for about six months, and I have three new bills that really begin, I think, to deal with it. One basically requires every school to have a true student government. Not that I ever participated, but for kids who want to be leaders and like this path, schools should give them the tools, the opportunity, the ability to stand up and speak about something. So that is one bill. It basically requires every high school, uh, every school, I think, over, with over ninth graders to have student government. The second one is to have voter registration two days at every high school. You know, we changed so 16 and 17 year olds can pre-register. Thanks to the league, yes, you do it. But there are lots of schools where the, somehow the league didn't get in or they don't have a social studies teacher like you or a history teacher uh, that encourages it. And I know um, there are schools throughout Westchester and throughout the state. We cannot, it's not the league's role to do what government should do. We should have every school have a table there just so you can register. So that's the second requirement. And third is to create a civics core for the year after high school, before going to college, you live at home and you intern in a government office. It could be your local supervisor, it could be your uh, assembly or senator, it could be your county executive, it could be the governor. It, you live at home, you get paid a stipend, basically minimum wage, you learn something about government. My experience with young men and women, when they get exposed, some of the cynicism drains away because they realize you actually are there to do something good. They feel part of the process, their views matter, and they are far more engaged in our process of democracy. So we are going to create, hopefully we get some money allocated to create the beginning of this civics core. And this really is, I think, very in sync with the league's uh, whole, whole model. And I'm going to stop, take questions and answers. But you can see we've been busy, but it's been a fantastic opportunity. It's been a moment in time. I tell people, do not blow it. This is our moment in time to get good things done for the people of New York. And thank you for letting me speak.
But no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Let me just swap get to the end of my swap. Second. This is yours. Let that's me just mine. Get the yours. There we go. Okay. All right, great. Okay. In keeping with the celebration of the 19th Amendment, uh, we have for Senator Mayer winning, uh, winning the Vote, which is a wonderful book that recounts uh, the national history of um, women getting the right Thank to vote. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. I also want to be able to bring up Robert Millman, and we have um, the raffle. But I also did, uh, Dare Thompson did come over and mention to me that the, that the league does have a, I think it's a curriculum, is that right, Laura, yes. on, yes. Uh, on civics? Yes. And uh, so I guess we're all doing everything we can. Yes. I would also say, you know, as sad as it is, that what happened in Parkland inspired our young people to understand and the litigation on climate change. That people aren't waiting to get the right to vote. Our young people are saying, hey, think about me and we've got to take, uh, you know, we've got to take action and I think as their parents, it's an incumbent upon us to listen to them and, uh, you know, follow their lead. Um, so, uh, uh, do we want to do the, yeah, we'll take, we'll do the questions and then we'll uh, do, the, do the raffle. We have, um, I, I tell we're going to do it this way. If you mention the question, because we're taping this for LMC TV, I'm going to repeat it uh, for the, tele for the uh, television folks at home. Uh, we also have a wireless mic. And we also have a wireless mic. So um, Marlene Colbert. Oh, Shelley is going to uh, uh, articulate uh, what happened in the Times today. I didn't have a chance okay. to read it, so please do. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. And before I do, I, 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 I neglected to mention Rachel Estroff, my chief of staff, who's been with me for seven years, who lives in Harrison, who, who taught me about the Sound Shore when I started to move over this way. So I, I'm so appreciative, and she's a fantastic asset to me. So in today's New York Times, there's a, what I would consider a very unfortunate story about conflict within our conference. And I mentioned we have 39 very different views. And usually what is said in that room, in my opinion, and I think Susie would agree, and, and Steve, that is viewed as sacred and should not be repeated outside that room. Unfortunately, it did get repeated outside that room. It's unfortunate when... Um, conflicts that are inevitable when you have new members and you have progressive members, it's uh, get blown out of proportion. We have conflict, you know, like like you were sitting at a, with family at post-Trump's victory and, you know, <laughs> you had somebody who really thought you were out of your mind. Uh, we have conflict and we have harsh conflict. It should be kept private. Uh, we, the, Andrea has done a remarkable job of holding a fractious conference together. I know she, we will recover from this as we recovered from the critique of us about Amazon. We're going to have our ups and downs. This was an unfortunate story. Should not have been in the paper, in my opinion. I don't, I, again, I don't say what happens in that room. Uh, question. Oh. No, that's not the wireless mic. That's their white mic, I think. Just speak. Please uh, speak on environmental issues. Yes. Uh, for example, the carbon tax bill that was introduced by Kevin Cahill on January 2nd. Do these kinds of bills have a future? Well, so the question was about environmental things, and I realized I didn't speak about them. They were in my notes. One thing is we did the the plastic bag ban, which is really great. I'm very happy about it. Uh, it's a step forward. The real climate change bill is a bill carried in our house by Senator Kaminsky that's carried by Assemblyman Engelbright in the Assembly that uh, really moves to speed up New York's transition to a carbon-free footprint. Um, we are, we ha are going to have more hearings about it. And I'm hopeful we can move it. There are people who have, you know, all these bills, the devil's in the details, and we gotta make the details right, and we ought not to be sloppy or premature. So Todd is a fantastic colleague, a big advocate for the environment from Long Island, and I'm hopeful we're gonna do that bill this year with some modifications. We have time for one more question. 
Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'll repeat it. Thank you. The question was about the Green Light New York bill, the bill that would allow uh, basically, as I say it, is people without a social security number to get a license, which was the case in New York prior to 9-11. was administratively changed so that you basically could not get a license unless you were documented. I've been a strong supporter of the bill for a long time. I believe uh, for, for a number of reasons, one, sort of the basic humanity of allowing people who live here, who frankly work here, whose kids go to school here, and who have to take their kids to the doctor, do whatever they have to do, go to work. I think we are better off a society where they have a license, they take a test, they have insurance on their car, and if somebody has a little fender bender, they don't run away so they're not found. So I think for that reason, as well as the public safety reasons, uh, two police chiefs in Westchester have come out in favor of it, the police chief of Ossining and the police chief of Portchester. I'm very, very thankful for that. I'm working with law enforcement to try to drive up support. I believe we have to spread support to a broader group of people, not just sort of maybe the people in this room. We have the immigrant issue is so toxic in some of our communities that we have to really legitimize this as a public safety issue. The other thing I like to always remind people is I represent McLean Avenue in Yonkers, and there are, this is not only a issue of the Hispanic community. All of our new immigrant communities drive to go to work when they get here, whether they are lawful or not. There are barmaids and carpenters on McLean Avenue who are driving without a license. So this is an issue of our immigrant communities being in, into our community in a lawful way. I, it does not authorize any other use other than driving. You cannot get on a plane, you cannot vote, you cannot do anything. So I support it. It, it is a challenging bill for some of our members. I'm just very honest about that, and I'm, uh, I'm hopeful, but I, I will wait and see. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Oh, I get to pick. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. I didn't have five dollars, so. The winner is 407943. 407943. Yay, Yay, Jay! And I just wanted to, one quick second, take a moment to thank Beth for all she does yeah. for this luncheon and all she does for the league because we couldn't do it without her. Uh, thank you so much, Shelley. There is so much going on. You see all the considerations, and I, I would just uh, say we are certainly living in interesting times. Um, and I think that the League of Women Voters helps us to clarify things and as a nonpartisan organization gives people like me and I think people in this room who have tremendous passion uh, about the rule of law, about civil society, about decency, um, I don't believe that those of us who feel so strongly about what America stands for, um, really have our voices heard because what makes news now is what is extreme. But there is so much energy and power of the people in this room, and I would ask all of you to be in touch, and we put our smarts together, and I frankly think there's nothing that we can't accomplish. I want to invite up in the last few minutes that we have, um, Robert Millman, who has uh, put together a film on gerrymandering. Um, so according to a New York constitutional amendment that will go into effect in 2020, a panel of 10 appointed citizens consisting of four citizens appointed by the majority party in the legislature, which now happen to be Democratic Party, uh, four appointed by the majority party, four by the minority party, and then two citizens selected by the first eight citizens will draw uh, congressional and statewide legislative voting districts. Now, the State Board of Election data reflects that Democrats, as I mentioned, is the majority party followed by Republicans, but when you aggregate 
all the other New York voters who are not affiliated with the two major parties, they collectively become the second party. Uh, so gerrymandering is seen as a tool uh, to give one political party an advantage over another. And while that is true, it obscures the larger issue that elections should be about voters and not parties. And that brings us to the documentary that Bob Millman has um, put together called Line in the Street. Please welcome filmmaker Robert Millman, who will say a few words. Hello, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, 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 this is the film, it does exist, it's online, it also is on disc. So New York just passed a constitutional amendment about uh, redistricting, so why should we care? Uh, we should care because if you don't pay attention, the rules don't matter. Uh, New York has a compact and contiguous uh, designation in its constitution, but we have the 101st Assembly District, which goes across six counties. We have the 46th Senate District, which goes across five counties. So we, we have to pay attention. The, uh, the analogy that, that, that occurred to me as I was sitting here is a, a while ago I was working at a company that saw the institution of a, uh, a computer IT department didn't have one when I began, and by the time I ended, they were running the place. So there, there's a kind of similarity there, is that uh, political parties are, are, were envisioned as a way to, for, to enable people to bring issues forward, but like IT departments in a lot of companies, they end up becoming not by design, but by fact, gatekeepers. So at any rate, from the President of the United States to the local animal control officer, gerrymandering affects how votes decide elections and consequently all policy elected, enacted by legislators. Any law, regulation, or funding choice that is a function of the legislature is manipulated by gerrymandering. Until now, all court attempts to unravel gerrymandering have concerned suits brought in federal court. My film, Line in the Street, focuses on the 2018 Pennsylvania State Supreme Court case, League of Women Voters, Pennsylvania, v. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which was premised exclusively on a state constitutional argument. The state court ruled in the plaintiff's favor and it resulted in a landmark decision that forced the redrawing of all congressional district maps in time for the 2018 elections, going from a gerrymandered 13 to five split to a nine to nine split, which actually reflects the state's electorate. So it, it's a unique victory that has kind of gone under the radar in a way, because we tend to focus on, on the magic bullet of the Supreme Court. And I have no idea what the Supreme Court is gonna do, but if passed as prologue, they're going to kick it down, the, kick the can down the road. And if they do that, the state constitution becomes the guiding document, if that's in fact what they do. So this film is about more than a singular landmark victory. Uh, it's, about the, it's about the US and Supreme Court and the legislative battles that voting is, is a civil right enshrined in every state constitution and every state constitution provides the equal protection of that right. So when people um, criticize gerrymandering reform, uh, what, what I have heard uh, is that, well, you're, you're trying to make it too perfect. You're, 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 your, your solutions are just a different political uh, uh, solution. And I, I just want to say that that's bunk. That what happened in Pennsylvania is that they decided on a really simple standard, compact and contiguous, split as few municipalities, towns, what have you, uh, 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 boroughs as possible. And they come up with a really simple, you know, workable solution that made a, a, a really big change. So to me, uh, 
democracy as a concept is not about things being perfect. It's about a kind of rough justice. And uh, uh, so anyhow, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. The film is online. It is titled Line in the Street. Uh, you can find it online. You can contact me at lineinthestreet at gmail.com. Uh, and uh, uh, I even have DVDs for sale, 10 bucks a pop. So I know time is short. I'm going to let everybody get on with their lives, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Are there any announcements that anyone wants to make for any programs that are upcoming? All right. How was lunch? It was good. All right. Thank you all for coming. This is a big year. This is 100 years. Think about, I remember when Christy Derrico was the president, and I, had, um, I was on the board then. She showed, was it called Iron Jaw Angels? Is that what it's called about the fight that women went through? Women literally risked their lives to get the vote, if you think about that. It seems like a very long time ago, and I guess that's my probably grandmother was, was as a part of that. It, it's a proud legacy that we have. And, uh, you know, and it's not exclusively women. There are many men who, have, who, who fought for the rights for women. But I think when we look back at the history, and I hope you will take a look at what I put on the table, because we understand how entrenched our, um, our history is and the roles that women played were very defined. Women were really not considered equal. Um, and, and so when you look at that sensibility, in that sense, we really have come a long way. And obviously, we have a lot of women whose voices are going to be able to speak in the legislature now, not only in New York State, but in the federal government. And we have our children. Um, and so we've got our work cut out for us. I, we will return to the trivia contest next year, so study up, please. And I look forward to seeing you all next year. Have a great year.